Welcome to another episode of the Kestrel Country Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Church, joined this week by Brandon Allen. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Mike. With Synergy One. Synergy One Lending. Is this your third time on the podcast? I think it is. I think it's your third. You get better and better. Frequent flyer mouse, man. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. And coming down. Uh, this as we head into September coming up almost. It's going by too quick. Crazy. Got kids back in school this week. I know. Kids are back in school. Um, all of a sudden, archery season is like right around the corner. So Feel I don't know how much in. hunting I'm going to get in this year, but um, there is a giant buck out there running around that I got my eyes on. So that, that we'll photo, pr- what a toad. I know. What a toad. A- we Ace, shall see. Yeah, you're going to get Ace on him? Um, I don't think so. Well, we'll see. I mean, if I don't, I'm going to, it sounds like a terrible dad thing to do. I'm going to get first crack at him. There you go. But that's just because I'm an archery hunt. Ace is going to rifle hunt. So if I don't get him in the archery season, then yeah, we'll try to get Ace on him Good for during you, the man. rifle season. Good but, for you. Yeah. Well, we're here to talk primarily about mortgages, homes, yeah. rates, recession, all the, all, all the good news, right? Everybody's yeah. just super <laughs> cheery right now. In the news, all the red this morning. Yeah, goodness gracious. We're seeing uh, big drops in S&P, you know, all equity markets down. I mean, we're losing gains big time. S&P's down 2.13%. NASDAQ's down 25 And really, all of this is in response to Jerome Powell coming out this morning. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, tell us, give us a little bit of background there. And then I know we've already covered this in a past podcast, yeah. but explain why the Fed rate is not the same as mortgage rates. Yeah. Because people hear the headlines. I mean, I used to think that. They were like, Fed's just raised rates. And yeah. it's like, oh, okay, they raised mortgage rates. Like, no, 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 definitely not the same thing. So first of all, what happened? Yeah. There's, um, They're hanging out in in Wyoming, Jack, yeah, Jackson, Jackson Hole. Yep. Yeah, so Jerome Powell basically came out. He, he's speaking at a symposium today um, where the investor, the markets were really anticipating some comments coming from him about what the Fed's position is going to be on uh, continuing to raise the Fed funds overnight rate, which is essentially the rate that banks lend overnight to each other. Um, This does have a lot of indications in regards to to, uh, what the Fed is trying to do, who controls economic and monetary policy, right? Yeah. Uh, What the Fed is trying to do with the economy. We know we've been fighting record high inflation, uh, and one, there's two ways to really reduce inflation. One is through taxation and the other is through raising rates. So they're wanting to intentionally slow down the economy by making uh, borrowers less apt to go to banks to borrow money. Because if banks lend each other money overnight at a more expensive rate, they just pass that down into their consumer lending products like credit cards, equity lines, um, auto loan rates. So they're trying to slow down the economy through that, uh, that mechanism. Why it doesn't impact mortgage rates um, all the time in the same way is because simply that uh, that interest rate doesn't control the bond market. The value of the okay. debt that's created is going to indicate what the rates are going to be for the money that you're borrowing. So, and is that because the the mortgage rates uh, mortgages are this? They're controlled by the secondary market. That's right. Right. That people are buying these mortgage backed securities. We heard we learned all about that after two thousand eight. Yeah. So. There, whereas the products, those retail products you're talking about, yep. those are just directly a bank right to the consumer. They're controlling those rates. Whereas this is more controlled by, hey, what is the market going to do exactly with these mortgage backed right. securities? Exactly right. Okay. So um, investors are going to have an appetite or less thereof for purchasing bonds, which is uh, somebody's promise to repay the debt and they're going to get a margin off of that. So if mortgage bonds or the mortgage debt uh, is seen as a valuable asset, that's more safe. It's more of a safe haven than stocks, right? Ownership parts of companies. Uh, then the, the price of that bond is going to increase, which is simply indicating to the market that we want more mortgage debt created so we can put them into bonds and investors will have a higher rate of return. Uh, but when investors sell off that debt, then bond prices go down and mortgage rates go up. It's just a gas pedal. And I think we talked about this on the last podcast a little bit, but um, the unique part of what's going on right now is that mortgage bonds are following the stock market. When the stock market's up, mortgage bond rates are up uh, and they normally have an inverse relationship to each other. Investors are either more apt to go into stocks uh, or bonds, not normally the same thing. And what we've seen for the last few weeks is that they're actually kind of following each other. When the stock market's up, mortgage bonds are up. 
uh, and vice versa. So and so when uh, when the bond rates are going down, yep, that's when mortgage rates, mortgage Go interest rates are going up. That's right. Obviously, to entice investors to buy those mortgages, right? That's right. So when you're saying that they're following stock market today, you know all the I. Pulled up the Wall Street Journal when I got to the office. It was like, oh, man, that's painful, right? Everything's red. Everything's going down. Yeah. Are we seeing the same thing then? Are, are mortgage rates up today then? They are. Yeah, mortgage rates are up today. Uh, we're starting to see some midday positive movement. The 10-year Treasury, of course, is another great indicator of where mortgage rates are going. Uh, but the Treasury is up today, down from where we started this week. So mortgage rates were up really high on Monday and Tuesday. They got a little bit better uh, Wednesday and Thursday today, we're looking pretty flat. Uh, so investors are kind of holding tight. It's really weird because there's norm there is going to be a time when the bond market and stock market disconnect. And this is one of the really big head scratchers that's going on right now uh, is we have, it's almost like putting two magnets together with the same poles. They just don't want to go together. Uh, and that's it. inflation and recession news. So yeah. that's, the, I mean, it's just really an interesting time. Hmm. What we're seeing, uh, and I think most prevalently, the thing that we're going to see in the next couple of weeks is that there will be this disconnect between the two. Recession fears are going to take over. Mortgage rates are going to start dropping back down. Uh, fingers crossed. Okay. So that's the, that's the hope. That, that's right. Well, nobody <laughs> hopes for a recession. Right. But as far as mortgage rates, for those yeah, people right. who are out there, you were mentioning earlier, like all those clients yeah. whose rates are floating right now. Yeah. That's the hope is that they'll start to diverge a little bit and right. we'll see, see that drop. That's exactly right. And okay. uh, the administration right now is being very uh, intentional in trying to curb Americans' fears of a recession. We had a uh, preliminary GDP come out yesterday, another third quarter negative GDP. Uh, from a technical level, two quarters of GDP uh, is a recessive right. economy. Uh, very interesting redefinition, uh, yeah. redefining of, <laughs> of a recession came out uh, last month, but ultimately the technical benchmarks are we're in a recession, um, which normally means great things for mortgage bonds. Right now we're, see we're seeing that like tug of war take place. Yeah. So uh, talk about that a little bit. Why, why are you saying that? What we, we went over this, um, you came by our team meeting earlier this week. Um, what makes you say that the recession, us being in a recession is going to be a good thing for yeah, mortgages. So if we take a look at this, this graph from fed.stlouisfed.org, uh, which is a great economic site, thousands of graphs that you can see, particularly around um, real estate uh, in conjunction to, you know, since the 1960s, but what it's doing with recessions. Uh, we see every time that we go into a recession that interest rates drop. We're, well, obviously, when we're looking back, 1975 through 19, 1985, some massive movements. Um, but then the more modern day recessions that we see in 90, of course, we see the early 2000 and then the big one, right? 06, 07, 08. Yeah. The, so the 06, 07, 08 one, that's what everybody's got in their minds, right? Yeah. That's the most recent. That's fresh in everybody's minds. Right. It was terrible, right? So what um, it seems like... The everybody right now is like, man, I don't know, backing off the real estate market a little bit. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? We're heading into recession. Um, and in in the that last recession, it was really a housing caused yeah. recession. Right. So we saw a drop in housing prices um, and and then coming out of the recession is where we started to see some rebound. That's right. Right. But you're saying that. Um, the fact that we're going into this recession without that big drop in prices might yep. mean that lower interest rates, which uh, is it universal? Do they always are lower? Are interest rates always mortgage interest rates always lower during a recession? Well, I guess always is a big is a big question. But oh, yeah. we're looking at this back to nineteen the early nineteen sixties. Okay, and we can see in every, every time there's been a recession, we see interest rates drop. Now that doesn't mean that when interest rates go down, we're in a recession, no, no, obviously no, no. Right. peaks and valleys here. But the, um, essentially what happens is in a recession, the economy slows down, consumers stop spending their money, they hold on to it. And in order to get out of the recession, the fed lowers their fed funds overnight rate, which is enticing people to go out and borrow money. Naturally there, that means that the housing sector is a part of that. And investors pour their money into mortgage bonds as a safe haven from 
the drop in equity markets, right? Like stocks. Um, and naturally that means that interest rates go down. Bond prices go up, interest rates go down. People start spending their money more. And of course, housing being one of the main drivers of our domestic economy, uh, it just touches so many different industries. But I think one thing to acknowledge is the fact that the last few years have felt a lot like 2004, five and six from the sense of it seemed like everybody had money. Boats, toys, side-by-sides, big trucks, gas-guzzling vehicles when gas prices were down. It really feels, it felt like those years. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And so now when we start to hear about recession coming back right on the heels of all of that money pouring into the economy, I can see why consumers feel that way. But the data is, yes, we do have a decline in demand for mortgages. We do have a decline in uh, demand for housing but we're not seeing a collapse of the housing market. If we go back, that's, yeah, that's for sure. Right. If we go back to this graph, this is the median sales price uh, sold for the United States. Again, same time frames. We can really start to see that the decline in home prices, the value of homes started well before the recession was, was indicated. And that's really what led us into the recession was this crash in the housing economy that came from bad mortgages. Yeah. Bad mortgages led us into this. Yeah. And so what has happened in the last, so you're, you're, uh, I liked what you said about, Hey, we're, it feels a lot like, Oh, four five, six, yeah. right. What is different right now in the mortgage world than it was pretty much everything. I mean, um, it seemed like everybody and their brother was borrowing money yeah. the last couple of years. What changed, what has, what should make us feel okay about that? Yeah, the, the standards for the mortgages that can go into mortgage bonds, which ultimately drive interest rates, the standards of those mortgages have dramatically increased. Consumers know within three days of their application what their estimated closing costs can be. There's a certain margin uh, of change that can take place from the initial estimate to the final closing cost. Uh, so consumers are well more educated, number one. Uh, number two is what's called the ability to repay. That's probably the biggest change is debt to income ratios are managed so, uh, so fiercely in the mortgage world that a consumer has to prove through documentation and historical data in their income that they can make that payment going forward for three years at a minimum. Okay. So let me be the devil's advocate here All right, or fine. the yeah, hard go. questions. What, um, yeah, but what happens if a bunch of people start losing their jobs? Yeah. Well, that'll happen. Right. Because the ability to repay is all well and good if you if you still have that job sure. that you had when you applied. But what if a bunch of people start losing their jobs? Well, there will be an increase in the foreclosure rate. We know that every recession there's been an increase in the foreclosure rate. The levels that we had in 2006, 7, and 8 were, were uh, dramatically higher. I don't have the data in front of me to talk about foreclosure rates. But if people do start losing, start losing their jobs, there will be home sales. Yeah. Um, the problem was in those times is that you had homeowners with three or four mortgages at one time. So the, it just multiplied when somebody wasn't able to make their ends meet. The homes weren't, they were getting listed and they weren't selling. So you saw short sales happening, right? Where you sell the house for less than you owe on it. There's this differential between that. Yep. Um, so yeah, there will be an increase in foreclosures. Uh, is it going to be something that's a foreclosure crisis like we had in 2006, definitely not. Yeah. It would take a massive, massive economic issue for that to take place. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I've uh, had has been going through my mind as well is that we're we've seen so much of a gain in equity over the last few years. Mm-hmm. I mean, somebody was just telling me Boise, it's like what almost doubled. Yeah. In the last couple of years, Dang near. was that you? Was telling I, I think me that? 30, was. 28 or 36 percent a year just over a year. Both incredible. Years. And so, yeah, they might. Uh, you know, values might decline there for sure. They, you know, what goes up must come down to a degree, but there's so much cushion in there that people are going to still have a lot of equity left in their homes. Um, which is, which is a good thing. Um, the other thing that I I haven't thinking about is I, I know that you were saying that the fed, one of the things they're trying to do is really, um, loosen up the, the, uh, labor market. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there is such a labor shortage all over the place that it seems like it's going to be pretty hard for people not to have some other avenue for getting another job or just filling, backfilling. And then you combine that with the fact that we're still millions of housing units B 
behind right. when it comes to just population growth and <laughs> building over the last few years. I think that's what I've come back to is, you know, the housing crash, um, uh, who knows? It's a crystal ball. We don't know exactly what's going to happen here, right? Like we could really hit into a giant recession that affects everything, right? But at the end of the day, you know, econ 101, right? You go back to high school and it's like supply versus demand. Yeah, that's right. At the end of the day, there is still strong demand for housing just from a population standpoint. I mean, there's just, sure. w- we need housing um, and the supply is still really low. And one of the things I've, I've found interesting to kind of watch is you're seeing a lot of builders pull back, um, which is not necessarily a good sign for the housing market, but we're getting ahead of things yeah. versus the last recession, right? The last recession, everybody was caught, you know, caught by surprise and there were half built subdivisions everywhere. Right. Like that was a huge part of it. You go into you know, these bigger markets. Well, I'm, I'm hearing from friends in Boise, there's, you know, a lot of contractors are canceling their reservations on lots. They're not building, they're not putting in those basements. So they're kind of, it's kind of like we're prepared for it in a way. So maybe the fact that everybody's a little gun shy is going to keep us out of that type of situation because, you know, home builders just aren't massively overbuilding. That's, that's actually another really good point. I think it's uh, pretty safe to say that if we had the supercharged economy continuing for another year or two years, where a lot of these new phase home starts took off that we could have found ourselves in a bad spot. But when you're talking about uh, home appreciation, going back to this graph, we see this skyrocket starting in 2020 when rates dipped, demand just exponentially grew at a rate that was not sustainable. If that would have continued, we very well could have seen ourselves in another bubble. But it does seem like it's being caught pretty early on. Now, do we think that we should have printed all that money for the two years that we did? No, we're seeing the effects of inflation from that. Right, yeah, still a bad move. We we might not think that, but there uh, looks like they're going to be printing a lot more of it. Uh, it's it's not slowing down. It seems. Yeah, we just I didn't have any student debt, but now I do apparently. So right, I'm just yeah. taking on other people's. That's uh yeah, man. <laughs> we could go down a rabbit hole there. Either way, I think that the uh, there's no spending our way out of inflation, right? We've got to slow down uh, how we're spending money. But when it comes down to consumers, you know, we're seeing gas prices fall a little bit. That's a good thing. You know, it feels like it's at least moving in the right direction. Are we, are we there yet? No. And that's essentially what Jerome Powell said, right? Hey, we're going to keep doing this until the job's done. Um, but the problem is, is that it's, uh, it's almost, we're going to create the problem and then fix it and beat our chest like we did this great thing. It's like, no, we're just correcting the error of our ways, uh, and the way we have to do that is going to be painful in some ways, right? There is the loosening of the job of the labor market. That means an increase in unemployment. And we yeah. just need to call it what it is. And I think one of the things, and you tell me if you're, if I'm wrong here, Mike, but one of the things that I feel like consumers in the marketplace are hesitant about is these trigger words, right? We've seen a shift in the market. We're seeing a softening here and there. We're balancing out. Let's just call it what it is, Right. Home price, there's more inventory on the market right now than what there was last year, right? Active inventory, yeah. Active inventory. Yep. Okay. Home Homes are not flying off the shelves like they were the last two years. Yeah, exactly. We're not getting $50,000 over ask minimum, it felt like, for a little while there. But were any of those things really good? No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, we were, I was just, I think on the last episode with Catherine was talking about that. It's like, we're seeing a normalization is really what I'm seeing so far. You know, we'll see what happens going Mm -hmm. into fall, but it feels like the market has normalized from that last two years, which to your point about that graph, this um, seeing in 2020, just this huge spike, that was abnormal. That was crazy. That was out of the norm. And it was, you know, people were doing things that weren't smart. You know, I never suggest anybody get a home without a home inspection and buyers would insist on it Mm -hmm. or our buyers would lose out to buyers who wouldn't get a home inspection or, you know, all these different things that they were doing that just weren't healthy. It wasn't helpful. Um, and now I think things are just normalizing a little bit more where you do see that week to two weeks on the market, you know, Mm -hmm. um, some longer, you know, but things are just feeling a little bit more normal. Buyers are able to take a breath they're able to actually go back and look, you know, it's like, yeah. I felt terrible. Somebody would be like, well, you know, can we think about it for a couple of days? Like, no, it'll be gone. Right. Yeah. Like, can I think about where I'm going to raise my kids for the next 10 years? Like, 
you know, sorry, you got to decide right now. Like it's terrible. Yeah. But now, you know, if somebody can go back, we can go look at the home again. You can consider it. You can weigh it against other options. People can just start feeling like they're making better decisions. Um, and then what I'm hoping for is that, um, we'll see a bit of a normalization to the seasonality mm. as well. So norm in the last, you know, number of years before the last two in Moscow, things would really slow down in the summer, mm. July, August, were a little slow. It was a bit of a, like a summer lull, summer slump. Once kids went back to school, you get into September, October, September and October were often a couple of my busiest months. And so we'll see. But I'm hopeful that this normalization is gonna mm. gonna go in that same direction and we'll see a little bit more activity. And obviously if if interest rates do start to come back down, like you're talking about going into fall, we really could see a nice bump moving into fall. Yeah, you know, that's that's that actually aligns with some of the uh, macro data that Fannie Mae came out with uh, in June, which said the levels of mortgage debt that's created this year uh, and into 2023 is looking like it will be on par with 2018, hmm. right? Interesting. Before things got a little hectic. So we are moving into a normalization. Uh, and I think that, like you said, nobody has a crystal ball, but hopefully we see that continue. Yeah. When it comes to what rates are doing though right now, I think we'll uh, maybe pivot over to this snapshot of the Fannie Mae 30 year, four and a half percent coupon. Yeah. Um, we're seeing this resistance level. We saw this resistance level formed in June, we saw it again in July. But this is one of the things that I think will really help consumers see that the Fed raising interest rates does not mean does not equate to what's going on in the mortgage world really well. So right in mid-May going into June, we saw uh, we heard rumblings that the Fed was going to raise rates 75 basis points, right? A, a big hike. And bond market responded really poorly. Investors started dumping their bonds. And rates shot up. We saw the highest highest point in rates. Yeah, so that's that dip you're seeing is the bond market dropping rates doing the inverse. Exactly right. Yep. This, this long streak of red. And right after that, Fed raised the rates and we had this really nice three-week period of rates getting better. They basically went back to down where they were in mid-May. Um, of course, they went up just a little bit again. And then in July, Fed comes out and raises rates another 75 basis points, but no drop-off meaning no skyrocket in interest rates. In fact, rates got better. Is that, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that's analogous to what the mark, the stock market does with, like, for example, the war in Ukraine, right? Mm, yeah. War in Ukraine, is Putin going to invade beginning of this year? It was like, is the weather going to do it? And is he going to do it? You know, and the, and the market was just dropping, dropping, yeah. dropping. He invades Ukraine and it starts going up. Yep. Right. It's because it's already built in. Exactly. Right? right. So is that is that the same idea here? The market kind of built in the fact that they knew the rates were going to get raised, so they were dropping. And then once they actually happen, it's like, yeah, okay. It happened. We're gonna it happened. Yeah. We're moving on. It's all about based upon speculation when it's pre interest rate uh Fed funds rate increase. And is that so now like today yeah. or today or yesterday? Uh was it today that Powell came out and said today. That? Today. He says they're going to continue to raise rates. Everyone expected that, I'm assuming. I think so. I, and I so don't know why there is that partly hesitation. why you're thinking that this might, we might have a similar trajectory here of rates going back down? I think so. And, and ultimately, one of the biggest reasons why is because when the Fed says we're going to raise interest rates, the Fed funds overnight rate until the job is done. What he's really saying is until there's a recession. They don't want to come out and just say, we want to drive our economy into a recession. Yeah, uh, we want this soft landing. All of that is just fluff. It's trying to not. Um, it's trying to not cause this really hard knee jerk reaction in the markets. But recession equals better things for interest rates. We just saw that on the graph. So yes, I do think this is bi this is baked in. Uh, when the Fed raises rates in September, I think we're going to see another rebound. Now again, no crystal ball here. Uh, I don't have a degree in economics, but after ten years in finance. I think that's what we're going to see. It has to, it has to happen. There needs to be that disconnect between stocks and bonds. What are you seeing with, um, locally your, um, basically pre, well, whether that's applications, mm -hmm. pre-approvals, are you seeing strong demand for it? Are you seeing people pull back a little bit? What's yeah. kind of, you know, obviously all the housing market, um, 
everything is inherently local. Yeah. And so, yeah, what are you seeing from a lending side locally? From a lending side, we're going to be about 10% up this year as okay. far as uh, the, the volume of mortgages that were created. We did see a slowdown in, in uh, referrals, pre-approvals uh, this month. Okay. Same thing that we saw in, Janu- in uh, July, around the 4th of July, which we hear is uh, very consistent with Moscow's market. Right, yeah. the Palouse region. Same thing right, in fact, right before you go back to school, a little slowdown. Uh, looking back at uh, our data from 2018, 2019, before the craze happened and there was no slowdown, uh, same thing. Yeah. So yep. I think we're going to continue to see a strong housing market here. We're not overbuilt. We don't have a ton of new inventory coming. We have the opportunity for new inventory to hit the market, but that's still a year out, right? So same thing. I think we're seeing a, 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 a seasonal dip and it's going to charge back, you know, until the holidays. Very good. And what are you telling people? Are you telling people to float right now if they can? Th- this week? Yes. Yeah. If you're closing in the next two weeks, you, it basically you're, you're getting what you're getting. If you didn't lock previously, this is where you're going to be at. It's going to sting for a little bit. Uh, watch the market for the refi and we'll get things moving then. But if you have the opportunity to float, I think right now is a decent time to do it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about why this is all, I I think, even relevant, which is one of the main reasons, one of the main reasons why real estate's purchased so consistently in America is because it's part of a wealth generation, right? The creation of wealth. Uh, There's there's no ability, the vast majority of us don't have the ability to outpace our earnings uh, in wealth creation that real estate can give us. If your 401k increases by 5%, you have 40 grand in there. And then your house is worth 400000 and it increases in value by 5%. Which one of those is going to yield more, more wealth in a shorter amount of time? And of course, it's going to be your home's appreciation. Yeah. Because it's appreciating based upon that, the value of the asset. So this is a, a graph that I learned from a coaching company that I subscribe to. It teaches me about business, team creation, mortgages, and faith. Uh, it's been fantastic for me. But uh, this model is not mine, so I don't want to... Uh, you know, infringe on the creator of it. But uh, it's basically been reviewed by some of the top financial managers in the nation. And this model has outpaced when they did analysis of it, outpaced what they could offer in their own professional services. So you're looking at primary luxury real estate. That term luxury is simply a home that you're proud to live in. It's it's not uh, well below your abilities uh, as far as payments concerned, because again, that asset will appreciate based upon its value, not the money that you put into it, and then looking for rental income, investment property, second home, commercial. So this is basically looking at real, how does real estate fit in with your overall wealth creation strategy? Exactly. That's the idea. Yeah. Which is interesting because I, uh, one of the things that that, um, I learned from my dad and, and have told people too, is like, you don't necessarily want to think of your home as an investment, but it probably is a big investment. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing because on one hand it is, it's a place to live. It's where you're going to be. It's yeah. not, I think one of the things that got us in trouble in the past is everybody thinking like, Oh man, this is going to be the best investment ever. I True. need four different houses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's maybe the difference is because you're saying primary luxury real estate, meaning, you know, living in a nice home, having a home that maybe is, it is your place to live, to enjoy. It's not, like your primary investment category, it's your house, but that's a way to continue to build wealth over time. That's exactly if, if we, if we were to go back to that graph from 1963, yeah. right, you see a significant appreciation over a long period of time. Exactly right. And, and there's no real 10 year window where you buy a piece of property and the value hasn't increased Yeah, since the sixties. Yeah. It's probably more thinking about it in terms of like, that's a, that's a piece of the wealth creation puzzle, but it should be seen as still as your primary home. That's right. Not just an investment, right? Because 100%. I think one of the things that we, that I've been telling people too, is like the last couple of years, you could buy a house, do basically nothing to it, sell it the next year and make yeah. great money. Right? That's right. Same thing with like buying Tesla stock or whatever. Yeah. It was like everything was going up. You yeah. could just buy it and sell it and do well we're probably moving into a, the type of market where you might have to hold a home for three or four or five years before it really ends up appreciating enough to deal with, you know, moving costs, closing costs, realtor yeah. fees, all that stuff. 
And so if you're thinking about it more as that long term, um, I don't know. Does that make sense to you? 100%. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, a well-rounded perspective on it. Uh, our, buying a home is inherently logical, but it's exceptionally emotional. Yeah, right? 100%. That's great. And we got to balance those two out. The other, the next piece of this is once you buy that primary luxury home is to get your reserves back, your liquid reserves back to 25 grand. And I think there's two reasons for this. Number one, it's going to keep you out of consumer debt, high interest consumer debt, credit cards, um, lines of credit. But it's also going to give you the ability to weather a financial storm. There's very few problems in life that you can't solve with twenty-four or $25,000. And if, if there is a bigger problem than that, you have a, a pretty big problem, right? So get your reserves back in alignment, $25,000. Once you hit that, um, then you start to take these next steps. What do you see um, from clients that are coming in, the vast majority of clients, do you feel like they're adequately positioned in their savings if they share that with you? Um, I, they, they don't as much get into that with me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, that's maybe it is something I shouldn't outsource as much, but it's like, that's more something that they're talking to with their lender, mm. with their financial advisors. Um, I think that it, um, I would say probably most people aren't adequately positioned in that way. Um, I do try to make prepare people for the costs of home ownership. Mm. And I think that's partly why this is so important that 25 can reserves is that, um, especially if somebody has been used to renting, right. Yeah. They're not necessarily going to be, you know, prepared when that furnace goes out or prepared when, Hey, you know, that when we're looking at this house, that roof has got a few years left on it. It's not necessarily a big red flag on your inspection, but yeah. just know you better start budgeting to replace that roof. Like there are those problems that, could, that can be fixed with 25,000 for a lot of people, a fair number of those problems might be house problems. Sure. Right. Something happens, something, you know, goes out, they need to replace a bunch of, or maybe not need, but want to replace a bunch of flooring or those kind of things. Um, $25,000 doesn't go nearly as far on a remodel as it used to, you know? So I do think that's, that's something that people need to be thinking about and planning for a little bit more. Savings. Rate of savings. Yeah. yeah. I would say um, the vast majority of clients that come in to buy their first house uh, will deplete the savings that they have down to a couple months of reserves. And the, the idea here is to look at how, what's your rate of savings going to be after post-closing, after you're making that mortgage payment? Do you have enough to adequately build mm-hmm. your savings back up? Yeah. Um, again, this is just an ideal picture, right? Uh, again, the majority of clients are wage earners. So they have a job, they have a 401k. It brings us to this next quadrant here, which is to, to max out your 401k and your IRA, especially if you have an employee match. Savings, get your $25,000 and then your 20% savings per month goes right into these investments uh, until you max it out. Also diversifying with a few mutual funds. And then the Mac Daddy of all of this, which is tanking today, but historically is yeah. the most consistent producing uh, index fund, right, in our nation's history, which is the S&P 500. 500 of the largest companies in America, very consistent, averages 9.3% rate of return per year over the last 30 years. Put your money in it. I think that uh, when we think about how we manage our money, and I'm I'm victim, uh, not victim, I'm, uh, uh, I'm guilty of this, is being hesitant to put my money into the stock market. It took me a long time to start putting my money outside of just a savings account. I wanted to see it. If I wanted to run to the bank and withdraw it, I wanted to do that. But that was strictly emotional. And when we think about actually creating generational wealth, it doesn't happen on accident. Right? The the families that are actually passing down to their children's children, they didn't do that on accident. They had a plan and they followed it and they, they kept emotions out of it. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it's funny. There's always like, right, like anytime you have a wheel, these kind of things, it's there's balance. Yeah. It's about balance, right? And being a real estate guy, like that's what I love. Like I definitely, I'm definitely off balance. Like that's where I tend to go yeah, is, real is into real estate. Um, so I have a bias towards it. I like, I like that. Maybe some of that's even like control. Like mm-hmm. I like being able to see it, touch it, feel it, work on it manage it myself versus like, man, who knows what all these companies are doing. So that's, I mean, that's kind of my, um, tendency, but you know, that it all makes sense. Yeah. At the end of the day, as long as you're investing, right. As long as you have a plan and you're actually investing, 
then over time, and this isn't, we're not talking about short term day trading where you're trying to ride and up and sell off before it falls. We're talking long term savings instead of your, instead, I mean, nobody should put money in CDs right now. See, biggest joke is the rate of return in your savings, right? Get your money into a position. Uh, but the other thing is there's a danger, especially we've seen this in the last two years, is there's this danger that everybody needs to be an entrepreneur of some sort. Everybody needs to buy an investment property. And I think one of the things that we have here locally is this um, kind of an, a, a, a false expectation that you need to be buying rental properties over and over again. And I'm not trying to knock investment uh, investing into real estate by any means, but make sure that you're, you're doing it wisely. Like if you're going to buy an investment yeah, property and you have no money left over at the end of the day, is that a wise investment? Yeah. Well, that, and that comes back to the preparing, right? Like, absolutely. Yeah. We, we own some rentals and know that those surprise expenses can come up 100%. and you better be, you better be prepared for them. And also just knowing that by like just buying a, a property doesn't mean it is a good investment. Right. Amen. Right. It goes back to the primary thing we were talking about earlier. It's like just because you have a primary home and you're paying that mortgage every month doesn't mean that's a good investment necessarily. Exactly right. right. Same with investment properties. And the reality is over the last couple of years, um, I mean, I've been watching and there are very, very few good investments, in my opinion, in in a lot of the the rental market here. It's just the prices got too high. Yep. Rental rates are still low. Now I think they'll catch up. But yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. You need to you need to analyze it. You need to not just jump on that bandwagon. Um, and I'm sure it's the same with the other types of financial, um, you know, other pieces of the financial picture too, right? It's like everybody was doing the meme stock thing or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And it's like just because that's what everybody's doing. In fact, maybe because everybody's doing it, you shouldn't do it. I don't know. But Well, you are you are definitely uh, the guy that leans on. If everybody's going one direction, you're going to pull back. <laughs> it's true. Your it's tendency. True. But here's here's another question for you. Um, how, many ty- how, how prevalent was the conversation of protecting money against inflation over the last oh, year? Oh, yeah. Huge. Okay. It's huge, right? How much some of us use that as an excuse to buy whatever, yeah. like, I would, Catherine? Like, I need this. I'm pretty sure I used it to buy a dirt bike, yeah, which is go. which is real bad. It was like, hey, you know, our money, it's, we're losing money on inflation. Yeah, I better yeah. buy this dirt bike. It didn't work out so great for me, but hey, you know what? We all we've all got to we've all got to do it. But how much of that do you feel like came from um, an emotional response to the talking points, right? Yep. Rather than a strategy to employ long term. Right. Yep. I agree. I, I would say a lot. Yeah. And that, and um, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that that much, but that could be why you're, why we saw such a runaway and consumer spending and that kind of thing is people were just like, spend, spend, spend. And yep. they had the money. The money was cheap and easy. And so, hey, let's get it into the economy, which was obviously part of their goal. Sure. Right. Coming out of COVID and all that stuff was like, hey, we need to inject money into the economy. 100%. We need to stimulate it. And they overdid it. Right. I agree. So now that's where that's why we are where we are. Because if your investment, whatever that investment is to hedge against inflation is not cash flowing to you. What is going to happen when you need that money? You have to sell the investment and you might have to sell the investment when it's lost value. So I think that this is why looking at a well-rounded, and this is this diversified portfolio, right, that we all hear about but don't know really what it is, yeah. is why it's so important to actually have a strategy. And talk to a financial advisor, Absolutely. right? Because neither of us are one. Are we With supposed the, to say that? Is that like a thing oh, you yes, have to we do? we are not financial <laughs> advisors. This is not so financial advice. Legal disclaimer. That's right. Uh, but it's dangerous. Uh, and find, find one that's a fiduciary. Right. Find one that has a legal obligation to do what's best for you and not try to sell a product that's going to make them more commission. Mm. Because if you're not, uh, everybody's persuaded by money to some extent, which is another great talking point. Right. Uh, No lender out there, no matter who you work with, their compensation cannot be based upon your interest rate, your fees, your program or your term. It's strictly based upon the amount of debt that you take out. And that's that's interesting. A, a federal regulation. I don't think I, I don't think I knew that. Which is important for consumers to know. Um, and I think that going back to how things have changed since 2006 and seven, right? That's one of the biggest ones. Consumers were being sold to 
into products that made the lenders more money that were less advantageous, if not uh, predatory towards the consumer. Mm. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. No, that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, so are you seeing buyers becoming more borrowers becoming much more rate conscious now, or do you think it's really had, was it the same when rate, interest rates were super low? Did yeah. people care less whether your rate was lower than somebody else's than they do now? Um, well, I think as a, as an industry, we shot ourselves in the foot. What did we sell on for the last two years? Interest right. rates. Yeah. And what are we not wanting to sell on right now? Because rates are higher interest rates. So yes, of course, consu- we've conditioned consumers. We are conditioned as consumers to be very rate conscious and everybody wants to know what the rate is. I think it's something that's super important to understand the cost of the money that you're borrowing, but also to understand what's the strategy behind it. If rates are over, I, I had a client last month uh, that simply did not want to buy. They were hundred percent ready to buy reserves, down payment, closing cost money set aside, stable jobs, great FICO scores, very little consumer debt. I don't want to buy a house because the rate's over 5%. Man, it, it, there was just no logic that you could employ mm. to help them feel differently. And it was an emotional decision because what are we still seeing in home values? The estimated home appreciation is up year over year. And we're expecting another 13% appreciation on the top end down to 7% on the bottom end in the next 12 months. So is your interest rate at 4% and the money that you'd spend at 4% versus 5% worth losing out on 7% appreciation conservatively. Yeah. Well, I think in that, that's where it comes back to, you know, we're talking about the emotional decision and, and maybe it's not right for those people to buy right now. Right. I mean, it depends on the, uh, there's a lot of circumstances, but is when they're so focused on that loss of appreciation or whatever, that they're losing focus on, Hey, this is a home. Right. Like this is, is true. this is a place to live. This is a place to, that you can have pride of ownership in, that you can work on, that you can do things that you can raise your kids in that, you know, like there's, there's a lot more to it. Um, and maybe that's partly why I really like real estate is it is this like tangible pride of ownership, this thing that you can see and walk by, you know, um, rather than just, uh, you know, being in the stock market or whatever. And I think that's where um, that's where the conversation I think is going to go a lot more. It's more like, okay, what are your goals? Mm. Financial goals are important, but there's a lot of other goals that are yeah, more true. important, right? Um, and what you know, well, maybe the housing market's going to drop. Yeah, maybe your landlord's going to raise their rent that's by true. you know, two hundred bucks a month when your lease is up, right? Like that. That's a very real thing that's going to happen because I do think there's a lot of places under rented in this town. And with the um, increases in taxes and fees and everything else and just, you know, cost of money and all of that hitting landlords, it's going to have to hit uh, tenants as well. And that's another thing to keep in mind is, yeah, you're at least you're fixing that rate for that's over true. the longer period of time versus, you know, you could end up, especially in this town. I mean, there's basically zero vacancy. So you could end up either having a massive increase in your rent or not even having a place to live and, right? and be stuck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because if you're, if people aren't buying homes, let's say Armageddon does happen. Where do they live? They rent. Yeah. Which means that demand for rentals go up and all of that money that you are pouring into the safety and security of having a dwelling uh, is in the hands of somebody else. That's man. It's, it's, it's definitely a balance. Are you finding that people are becoming more hesitant on, engaging with you and open and honest conversations around home ownership? No, I wouldn't say that. I think overall volume is just down. Yeah. So fewer people overall, um, talking, you know, um, I know like some of our agents are dealing maybe more with younger first time home buyers. Um, and they're seeing more of that hesitancy. Like you just talked about mm-hmm. of like, you know what, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines for a little while. Um, the Catherine and I were joking yesterday. I was like, maybe you should just tell people like, you know, you should really just sit on the sidelines for the next two months during hunting season. And then, you know, <laughs> I think the market's going to pick back up. So I would just recommend oh, not even looking at houses for the next couple months. That's you know, funny. That's obviously a joke, but, um, yeah, I do think some people are like in that hesitancy mindset, which is understandable. Things have been yeah. very volatile, um, this summer and, 
it'll be interesting to see what happens going into fall, how things settle out. And like I said, I'm expecting to see activity pick back up as we get into fall. Um, as people want to get things done before the end of the year, before the snow flies, that happens a lot. So, but we'll see what happens. It's uh yeah, Moscow is a, it's a great place to live, great place to own property. And so I think it's going to continue to, to be that um, over the long haul. So outside of hunting season, uh, what would be the best way for somebody to contact you if they were one, <laughs> of yeah. course, joke again, but what, what would be the best way to somebody for somebody to get raw information uh, without feeling like, of course, you're not, you're not pressuring people to buy, but what's the best way for people to get information about the housing market and their options when it comes to uh, your services? Yeah. I mean, obviously uh, I think, and there was somebody just quoted, I can't remember where that article was, but it was like, it was kind of dogging on Zestimates. Oh yeah. Did you post that? I did. Yeah. Dogging on Zestimates. And it was like, what's the best way to find out true is like talk to a real estate agent, but it's true. I mean, having somebody, you know, just like your t-shirt there lend local, right. It's like having a local lender, having somebody to, to, to advocate for you and to help you out. Having that personal relationship, I think is super important. Um, some friends just started, uh, this is a total tangent, but you'll see how it relates. Um, a handyman company okay, cool. called my guy. Oh, there you go. And I thought it was great because that's, everybody wants a guy in uh, whatever space. I was this uh, Sicilian guy that was a customer of my dad's back in Detroit would always, that's what he told me when I first got into real estate. He goes, you know, Mike, like everybody wants to have a guy. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, <laughs> you know, like, Hey. You need some? Call my guy. Yeah, you get call you my go. guy. He's got it. And um, and, but I think that's true. Like you want your mechanic. You want everybody wants to have their person. And the same is true in this, if if not more so. Like you just said, finding that fiduciary mm. financial advisor. Um, so for sure, talking to to them. I mean, we we do try in our social media as well to put out a lot of data, put out a lot of information, um, so that you can get that, that raw data. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's obviously the place to be. And I think again, the housing market slowing down, hopefully will allow buyers to become much more educated. And I tell people all the time, it's like, just go look at a bunch of houses. Mm. Like that's what we're here for is to help you out and don't feel bad about like, let's go, let's go look at that one. Maybe it's not exactly what we want, but let's go walk through it. You walk through five or 10 houses, you're going to feel so much more confident when it comes time to jump on it. Right. And I was, I would assume the same or similar for you. It's like, I, I tell buyers like, go meet, maybe you don't think, maybe you think you're a year or two out from buying a house, go meet with Brandon, go meet with a, a lender, talk to him now about it and start thinking through it, running those numbers. Yeah. So you're not like, Oh man, there's the house I want to buy. And now I'm behind the eight ball and right. I'm rushing to get it all figured out. Right. I think that's, that's some of the good things about this market slowing down is just, figure it out, take a breath. And sure. It's if you want to take the next two months off and go hunting, I'll, I'll be fine. <laughs> no, but it is, it's just slow down, gather the yeah. information so that you can feel confident. Like that's what we want, right? Absolutely. We want people, we want to be able to help them feel confident about those decisions. Um, so that's really yeah. good. Well, I'll tell anyway. you, Mike, the, uh, and I, and I say this, honestly, this is not just because I'm on the Kestrel country podcast, but I, I've told many people that if I, if something happened to me, if I went into a coma, and my wife and daughters needed to buy a house, I would trust you and your advice that you gave them. Truthfully well, and honestly. So thanks, if you man. have questions about real estate, hit up Mike Church. He's going to give it to you I straight. hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, me too. Of course. You know. <laughs> me too. Um, yeah, you're just an honest, straight up season, guy. Though. And uh, you, have the re- you have the respect of a lot of agents in town, m- many, many agents outside of your brokerage. And, uh, and I respect you a lot. So thank you for having me on today. Um, and when it comes down to buying a house, it's never too early to start understanding the information that's going to allow you to make a confident and educated choice. hundred percent. Yep. Start early. Good deal, brother. That's it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for joining us. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you next week.